Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to the fifth video in my Revolution Software Retrospective. If you haven't watched the previous videos in this series, I suggest you do so before watching this one. Today we'll be talking about In Cold Blood, Revolution's fifth game and their first entry into the world of 3D. After the great success of the first two Broken Sword games, Sony Computer Entertainment asked Revolution to develop a new game for their console. The game was initially released in the year 2000 on PS1, and was published by Sony Computer Entertainment Europe in… well… Europe. Later on, it was published on PC by Ubisoft. The US version was released 5 months later and was published by Dreamcatcher Games on both PC and PS1. This time, however, they did not make a conventional adventure game. Charles Cecil wanted the game to be a departure from the point-and-click style they were known for. Instead, he wanted to make an action-adventure hybrid with a secret agent theme to it. Was this genre shift a good idea, or did it backfire? Was the game able to stand out within its genre, or did it end up being a forgettable game that you discover when checking a list of Revolution's games for your Revolution Software Retrospective? Normally, I would say something like, to answer these questions and more, let's dive right in. But honestly, this game doesn't deserve the suspense you'd go through if I did that. In Cold Blood is an awful game, and I hated every minute of it. I can't think of a single redeeming factor about this game. I guess the story is a bit interesting. Not interesting enough to keep me playing the game, though. The game has 9 missions, and I couldn't get past the 4th one. So even if I wanted to spoil the game's story, I can't. Here's everything I know about the story, though. The American government sent a secret agent named Kiefer to investigate a uranium mine in the fictional country of Volgia. However, during his mission, they lost contact with him. So they asked the British government for help. So they send an MI6 agent by the name of John Cord to locate Kiefer. However, apparently he gets captured at some point as the game's events take place in Cord's memory whilst he is being interrogated by Dmitry Nagarov, the self-appointed president of Volgia. With the help of Kostov, leader of the Volgian freedom fighters, you enter the mines and locate the now-deceased Kiefer. During your search for Kiefer, you meet a scientist who is forced to work for Nagarov against his will. He tells you that this mine isn't really for uranium, but rather for a compound called trinephaline, also known as blue nepheline. It's a special compound that is supposed to provide infinite energy and Nagarov plans to use it to improve his military's power. Honestly, I had to go back and check the footage I recorded to remember the game's plot because I genuinely forgot most of it. The story isn't bad, but it isn't good either, and it's quite forgettable. If you're a fan of James Bond movies, you might find something to enjoy in this game. Personally though, I don't fancy this setting, and the story wasn't good enough to keep me invested. None of the characters were interesting, and the setting is very dull. And I could see the plot twist a mile away. The writing definitely didn't help. I criticized the writing in Broken Sword 2, The Smoking Mirror, but that's mostly because it was a huge step down from the writing in Shadow of the Templars. However, compared to this, Smoking Mirror's writing is Shakespeare. In Cold Blood's writing is horrible. The terminal. It's bust, so there's no use trying it. Okay, just checking. The drama is awful. My name is Chiling Chung, sir. I work in cleaning and maintenance division. You are searched. You are carrying a weapon. I found it, sir. You are an agent. I am nobody, sir. You are lying, mongrel. I will beat the truth out of you. The humor is abysmal. Listen, I've had enough of this. Can one of you give me some answers? Ooh! I think he's upset. I've had enough of this. And the conversation system is embarrassing. Have you heard the score? No, what is it? Dynamo Dolesky are beating Spartak 2-0. What? I know. That's bad. Have you heard the score? Yes, you already told me that we're losing 2-0. The game has this system where you can threaten non-security personnel, such as technicians, which sometimes yields info they wouldn't have given you otherwise. However, its implementation is laughable. It's like all these people have short-term memory loss, and they immediately forget that you're armed. Hello? I'm listening to the match. Give it to Vlodov. Do as you're told and I won't have to hurt you. Oh. What do you want? Tell me about the American agent. Well, I'm new here, so I don't know anything. Truly. Hello? I'm listening to the match. Sometimes it doesn't even make sense. For example, this guy is withholding information about his interactions with Kiefer. What do you know about that foreign agent? 
I know that he caused me trouble. Oh yes? What did he do? That's between me and security, all right? And for some reason, you don't have any control over what questions Court asks when threatening someone. So even though it would make total sense for Court to force the answer out of this guy, he instead just says a generic threat that does nothing. I mean business. All right, all right. What do you want from me? Raise the alarm and you're dead. These generic threats are so bad. Every time you threaten someone who doesn't have any info you need, Court just makes an empty threat, such as coming back for them if they ever tell anyone that they saw him, which is completely pointless and it takes us out of the experience. Tell anyone I was here and I'll be back for you. Understand? Yes, sir. It makes Cord look like a James Bond wannabe who has absolutely no idea what he's doing. And the humor in this game is... I don't even know how to explain it. I mean, Broken Sword 2 had some awful jokes, such as this one. Excuse me? Huh? Who's there? However, at least in that game, we had some decent jokes before we were treated to this masterpiece. In In Cold Blood, however, this is the first interaction you have in the game. This is the literal first sentence you get after the game's opening cutscene. Uh. Alpha's intelligence on Kostov was spot on. Kord's snarky remarks are also pretty bad. It's not good enough, you know. I could have been killed in here. Don't worry, there's still time. Hmm. Keen sense of hygiene, your average Vulgian. Hmm. Very cozy. Not just because they're unfunny, but also because they ruin an otherwise atmospheric moment. Take this part, for example. Whilst at the containment facility, you hear about a horrible incident that happened in the Kappa level. You get there, and this is what you're greeted with. I had no idea what happened here, and no idea who or what is responsible for this. And it made me feel uneasy and kind of scared to explore the level. Contemporary art. You either get it, or you don't. That is, of course, until Court starts cracking jokes, completely ruining my immersion. Just a regular everyday body on a spike. Nothing out of the ordinary. This is honestly depressing. How did we go from this? As I picked myself up, all I could hear was the ceaseless drone of traffic. Life went on around me. But the explosion was to change my life forever. To this. Uh. Also, listen to this line. Guns. Not really an accountant thing, eh? Don't kill me. Ha. Accountants. Think they're all heroes these days. Who says that? Is this really a thing? I've rarely talked to accountants in my life, so is this a well-known stereotype I am unaware of? Makes me wonder what sort of accountant Cecil worked with. And what's horrible writing without horrible voice acting? What's the score? Dynamo Deleski are beating Spartak 2-0. Oh good. What? I mean, that's bad. Uh, very bad. I'll admit, I may have been a bit too harsh on the voice acting in Smoking Mirror. Personally, I didn't like it. However, I understand why some people might want to defend it. The voice acting in this game, however, is inexcusable, and I can't imagine anyone justifying it. There's been a breach in security, sir. What? Someone's in the building? Yes, sir. Came in through the sewers. Is the Tolstov girl still secure? She's been brought up from the cells. Good. I want the intruder found. Any more mistakes like this, and you'll all answer to me. It's like Revolution were working on a parody of In Cold Blood on the side, just for laughs, and they used the voice acting of that parody in the final release by mistake. Can't you see I'm busy? Try the quartermaster. He might have one. And the accents are so bad. It's like all the actors went to the Aaron Hansen School of Eastern European accents. You going to listen to the match? Uh, maybe, Alexei. Let's meet for a beer later. At least the music is pretty good, I guess. I mean, it was composed by Barrington Phelong, so it's bound to be good to some extent. It wasn't as good as the music of Broken Sword 1 and 2, though, and I wouldn't consider it a redeeming factor. 
The visuals aren't bad either. They're not groundbreaking or anything, but at least they're competent. Still, I'm a bit disappointed because Revolution games are usually beautiful and are on par with, if not better than, their best looking peers. If I were to compare Broken Sword 1 to its 2D hand-drawn peers, it would definitely stand out. However, when comparing In Cold Blood to other games of the same art style, as in games with pre-rendered backgrounds and 3D character models, it feels kinda inferior. Especially considering games like Resident Evil 3 and Oddworld Abe's Exodus came out before In Cold Blood. The game just looks dull and uninteresting. Almost every scene is either grey or brown or yellow, and it gets boring real quick. And I have no idea what's happening here. The animations are also pretty weird. They feel very stiff and choppy, and some of them are quite hilarious. This one always cracks me up. As for the cutscenes, can't say I was a fan of them. Then again, I put the blame for that more on that specific era than I do on the game itself. This was an awkward time for 3D games, and most of them had pretty janky cutscenes. So it would be unfair of me to criticize this particular one. Especially since this was Revolution's first 3D title, and they did a pretty good job, all things considered. I wasn't impressed by the story or the visuals, and I genuinely hated the writing and the voice acting. However, none of those would have stopped me from playing the game if the gameplay itself was good. Resident Evil 1 had awful writing, yet I loved it because of its gameplay. Robbie Ribby had mediocre visuals, yet I loved it because of its gameplay. Crash Bandicoot barely had a story, yet I still loved it because of its gameplay. Seeing how I've already mentioned that I did not beat this game, I assume you know where I'm going with this. In Cold Blood does not have good gameplay. The game is at odds with itself. It's trying to be an adventure game and it's trying to be an action game. And it fails on both accounts. It's like Revolution were focusing so much on making the game appeal to two different crowds, it seems they forgot that these two aspects need to be good. Take the adventure part of the game for example. In Cold Blood has its fair share of puzzles, however most of them revolve around going to a place, hitting an obstacle, looking for a specific technician or terminal that could help you with removing said obstacle, then going on your merry way. Even if you've already talked to the necessary technician or checked the necessary terminal beforehand, the option just won't be there. You still need to go to the obstacle, then come back to remove it. These puzzles are never challenging. As long as you check every single terminal you find, and talk to every single technician you encounter, you'll never be lost. You will, however, be annoyed, as going from one room to the other is not just time-wasting, but it's also very frustrating. We'll get to why later, though. During my time with the game, I encountered a few inventory-based puzzles, such as using this test bolt on the particle accelerator, or finding this probe to use on this bomb. However, none of them were particularly interesting or difficult to figure out. The test bolt you need is in the same exact room as the particle accelerator, and the man who planted the bomb specifically tells you that you need his probe. And guess what? It's in the room right next to his. There is a bit of investigation required to find the bomb though. But again, it's just like the rest of the puzzles in this game. Find the necessary terminal and it will solve the problem for you. The puzzles in Resident Evil weren't the greatest, but at least they gave you that yes, this is what I needed feeling when you find an item you were looking for. Resident Evil also trusts you to combine items on your own. In this game, however, Cord combines them without any input from you. When I got the cable from this guy, Cord automatically attached it to the steel pin I found before getting the cable. The game just doesn't trust the player to figure this out on their own. It's not like finding the pin was difficult or anything. It was in the same room I get the cable in. And there is no way you could miss it, as pickable items in this game give off a very noticeable sparkle. There are also some stealth related puzzles where you need to get rid of robots since you can't just shoot them. You basically need to install a device in their charging ports and as soon as they reach it they get neutralized. Those puzzles were fine I guess. Keeping tabs on robots on your Remora was a cool idea, however this wasn't enough to keep me interested in the game's puzzles. Speaking of the Remora, there is one puzzle that gave me hope, but nothing came out of it. The Remora acts as your map, radar, and means to connect to terminals. 
You can also use it to contact specific NPCs, such as this part where you need to ask Kostov for help in distracting these guards so you can sneak by. When I reached this part, I received a message from Kostov asking if I needed help. So I thought this was probably to teach me that some puzzles can only be solved by the help of one of your contacts. The only problem is this never happens again. Granted, I didn't beat the game. However, I find it upsetting that this sort of puzzle happens only once in the first four missions of the game. And it was literally spelled out for you. You didn't need to figure it out on your own. I don't think it's unfair of me to expect more from one of the best adventure game developers out there. This is the same team that made Beneath a Steel Sky and Broken Sword 2. And even if I had issues with Broken Sword 1, that too had its share of well-made puzzles. There was, however, one puzzle that I really liked, and it was at the Kappa level in the containment facility. After a bit of exploration, you find out that this robot is the reason for this mess. Now it's on your tail, and no amount of shooting will get rid of it. What you need to do is keep an eye out for it on your remora whilst priming up this robotic arm. Once you do so, as soon as it's in the arm's path, you pull this lever and the arm pushes the robot into these electric poles, which causes it to break down. I genuinely liked this puzzle, because not only was it nerve-wracking, making sure you don't get in the robot's path, but it was also very fun to solve. No, let me rephrase that. The puzzle itself wasn't fun to solve at all, but rather figuring out what I needed to do was fun. Executing the puzzle was torture. Which brings us to the action part of the game. Unlike Revolution's previous games, this one has a mixture of action and stealth elements. It has a lot in common with other tank control games with fixed camera angles, such as Resident Evil, Dino Crisis, and Fear Effect. Now, I personally have no issue with tank controls, and I do think they could be done right. For example, I played Resident Evil 3 to record some footage for this review, and I ended up beating it because of how much fun I was having. However, the tank controls in this game are horrible. Whilst running, you can barely make a curve, making running feel very awkward. In a game where you need to backtrack a lot, the worst thing you could do is make running around a hindrance. The main reason why running in this game is so annoying is because whenever you hit a wall, you either ricochet off of it, or more likely, you get stuck. The number of times I got stuck on a doorframe whilst running is honestly quite impressive. This doesn't happen in games like Fear Effect and Resident Evil. In those games, when you hit a wall, you continue running, slowly sliding against the wall towards the place you wanted to go. Even in Grim Fandango, another game with bad tank controls, you don't get stuck when you hit a wall. Climbing stairs is also a pain. As soon as you're on a staircase, you're stuck with only two directions, either up or down. And you can only run on stairs if you started climbing them or going down them whilst running. You can't start running once you're on them. You also can't steer cord when walking backwards. I'll be honest, I barely used this feature when playing Resident Evil, Grim Fandango, and Fear Effect. However, when I played this game, I realized that I was taking this feature for granted. Tank controls are clunky and rigid by nature, so it's quite amazing that Revolution was able to make it even more clunky and rigid. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's unfair of me to compare this game to a game made by Capcom, a company that's much bigger than Revolution, even at the time. But I honestly don't buy that as an excuse. Sure, Revolution were a relatively smaller team, however the foundation was already there. I wasn't asking them to be innovative, I was asking them to copy what others have done even as far as four years ago. When you're making an adventure game, you can be excused for bad controls, that's why a game like Grim Fandango could get away with awful controls and still be considered a masterpiece. However, when a game requires stealth and precision, controls need to be a priority. What's the point of a stealth action game if controlling the character is a chore? Oh, by the way, the game has stealth mechanics, but I forgot about them because of how basic they are. All you can do is move around while crouching and sucker punching enemies on the back of their heads, which apparently kills them immediately. It also never ceases to be funny. However, that's about it. You can't do stuff like peeking around corners or getting the attention of specific guards. You can only crouch behind some boxes and wait for enemies to have their backs towards you. 
This doesn't always work though, since sometimes you can get shot by enemies off screen that you weren't aware of, rendering your stealth kill completely pointless. You could check your remora for close by enemies, but it doesn't really help that much. The remora only differentiates between humans and robots, however it does not differentiate between security and technicians. It doesn't even tell you what direction they're facing. So unless you are literally looking at an enemy, there is really no way to know whether it's safe to move or not. Honestly though, that wouldn't have been an issue if the game's combat was good. Fear Effect had very basic stealth mechanics. However, you barely needed to rely on stealth because the combat was fun and well implemented. Sadly, that's not the case in this game. The combat is an absolute mess and it's not just because of the clunky controls, although that is a big factor. You literally just stand there and keep shooting till all the enemies are down. As soon as you start shooting an enemy, you stun lock them and they can't do anything whilst you're shooting them. So your success basically relies on whether you're the first one to shoot or not. That's easier said than done though, because there's a delay in taking actions and the game doesn't allow you to take two actions at the same time, such as being able to move freely while you're holding your gun. And since you go down just as fast as enemies do, expect to die a lot in this game, especially when facing many enemies. Fortunately, you can save your game anytime you want. Unfortunately, your movement is very limited when your weapon is drawn. So you're just stuck there hoping that your enemies go down before you do. I can understand this sort of thing in horror games such as Resident Evil, where these restrictions add to your feeling of helplessness. However, in action games where you're on equal grounds with most of your enemies, these restrictions should not exist. There's also no variety in weapons whatsoever. Remember how many weapons you get in Resident Evil, and how each one of them is unique and has its own cons and pros? And remember how in Fear Effect you can hold two Uzis at the same time? That's one of the reasons why combat in those games is actually fun. In Cold Blood had none of that. You get one weapon and one weapon only. You can't enhance it, you can't change anything about it, and you can't find enhanced bullets for it. This makes every combat moment feel exactly the same as the one before it. And it's not like you can rely on stealth to avoid combat as the stealth option is not always available. Besides, you need to kill as many enemies as you can to loot them. There are two types of loot in this game. Bullets, which I never seem to run out of, and medkits, which are a lot rarer than they should be, seeing how easy it is to lose health in this game. So if you ever choose to play this game, try to get as many medkits as possible because I'm about to tell you why I stopped playing this game. After finishing the Kappa level, which caused me to use all my medkits, I reached this part where a security guard is waiting for me to use this elevator. As soon as I reach the ground level, he starts firing at me. All I have is a sliver of health, so one shot is enough to kill me. And since you can't take two actions at the same time, I can't use the elevator whilst my gun is out. So the game is expecting me to use the elevator, take out my gun, start shooting immediately, before getting shot once by the security guard who's waiting to shoot whatever comes out of that elevator. With the delay in button presses, that's absolutely impossible. I tried so many times, it's not happening, I always get shot first. I can't go back to try and find more medkits, and I can't go forward because I immediately get shot as soon as I get out of the elevator. I am literally stuck in this limbo. So I had two options. Either A, restart the entire mission, which includes the process of entering Kappa level and Kappa level itself, or B, stop playing this game, uninstall it, and never think about it ever again. I'm sorry everyone, I took option B. I can't stand this game, I dislike everything about it. The story is bland, the visuals are boring, the writing is abysmal, and the gameplay is awful. If you want to play the game for yourself, you can get it on GOG, but really, why would you? If you want a good 3D adventure game from the same era, just go play Grim Fandango. If you want a good action game from that era, go play Siphon Filter. Or you could play Fear Effect, which achieves what In Cold Blood was trying to achieve, which is a good mixture of action, adventure, and stealth elements. Difference is, Fear Effect is actually fun, controls well, and has interesting puzzles. 
I feel kinda guilty about reviewing a game I didn't beat, so to make up for that, here's an extra review. A few months after In Cold Blood's release, Revolution released another 3D game and that game was Golden Glory, The Road to El Dorado. I remember playing this game as a kid and I remember enjoying it quite a lot. However, I also remember enjoying We're Back, a dinosaur story as a kid. So with all honesty, I trust Kid Nijo's taste in video games just as much as I trust Adult Nijo's upload schedule. I also remember loving the movie that the game was based on. So before playing the game, I decided to rewatch the movie, and I was pleasantly surprised. Sure, it's not a great cinema masterpiece, but it was funny, enjoyable, and had a brilliant soundtrack. Seeing how Kid Nijo was right about the movie, I was feeling quite optimistic. Here's hoping I'll at least enjoy it more than I enjoyed In Cold Blood. The story is an abbreviated version of the movie's story. However, it kinda annoyed me how abbreviated it was. Most of the story is told by Miguel and Tulio in these cutscenes, including the entirety of their stay in El Dorado. It directly goes from finding El Dorado to the part where Tsekul Khan is chasing them as a giant jaguar. You spend no time whatsoever in El Dorado between these two points, which I feel is kind of a missed opportunity. I guess since it came out two days after the movie's release, they didn't want a game that spoils the entire movie. Still though, I feel like it would have benefited from an extra level, seeing how short the game ended up being. The writing is not good. Could you give me a small bag of corn? Give me one peseta and I shall. One peseta? That's all the money we have in the world! However, it's nowhere near as bad as the writing in In Cold Blood. This game is meant for kids, and the writing is good enough for kids, I guess. Here, chick chick chicky! Yum! Lovely corn! Say goodbye to freedom, bird. In fact, some of the jokes aren't half bad. We've done it! He's run off! Yay, us. We outwitted a six-year-old. It can get quite cheesy, and some of it will drag on a bit. Greetings and salutations. I am the Great Malazo. We heard. Of course, my fame has spread all across the world. No, we heard it from you just now. But for the most part, it's inoffensive. Though, I'm not sure if I can excuse it much, seeing how the movie was also for kids, yet it had much better writing. I did like how they captured the characters' unique personalities, though. Altivo! Altivo! Here, boy! I've got a lovely apple, Altivo! Want it? Come on, boy! Get me the keys! <laughs> and you call me optimistic! Well, most of the time, anyway. Because in the movie, it's Miguel's idea to ask Altivo for help, and it was Tulio that was doubting him. But that's not much of a big deal, and as I said, as far as a kid's game goes, the writing isn't bad. The voice acting isn't bad either. Hello? What do you do? I stand here and make sure nobody opens that gate. It doesn't sound very exciting. In this line of work, excitement is something to be avoided. The voice actors of Tulio and Miguel did a really good job at imitating Kevin Klein's and Kenneth Branagh's voices. El Dorado! Yes, El Dorado! What an adventure! What a story! Who would believe it? Who could possibly tell it? And supporting roles aren't that bad. Hello, my friends. Would you care to indulge in a game of chance? Definitely better than what we got in In Cold Blood. Can't you see I'm busy? As for the visuals, the game looks fine, considering Revolution probably didn't have much time to work on it, as they had to release it at the same time as the movie, and they were probably still working on In Cold Blood at the same time. So all things considered, I guess it looks good enough. I also like the walking and running animations, however the rest of the animations are kinda weird, such as this one where Tulio catches a chicken. The gameplay in this game is similar to that of Grim Fandango and Escape from Monkey Island. It's a 3D adventure game through and through, no action and no stealth. Well, there is a little bit of stealth, but no action, that's for sure. The game is full of puzzles, and honestly they're not bad at all. They're especially good if you want to get kids into the genre. 
I also liked how some puzzles can only be solved by Miguel and some by Tulio. And it's usually not difficult to figure out which character to use for which puzzle. Some of them are inventory based puzzles, such as this one where you need to use a carrot to make this donkey move, whilst others are logic based puzzles, such as this one where you need to keep pulling levers until you open the door you want to go through. There are even puzzles that require constantly switching between characters. Which makes me wonder why they didn't add Chell as a playable character. In fact, outside the movie clips, Chell isn't even in the game, which is again a missed opportunity. I have to say though, as much as I praised the puzzles, they were a bit too easy to figure out. I mean, sure, this is a game for kids, I get that. But I'm sure kids could handle a bit more challenge. Also, if this game is only for kids, then can you explain this please? Another issue I have with this game is an issue I had with In Cold Blood. The controls. Looks like Revolution learned nothing from their mistakes with In Cold Blood, as the game's tank controls are just as bad. Unlike In Cold Blood though, the rest of the game is not that bad, and I was able to beat this one. I had some trouble with its controls, however it kept me entertained for the most part. It's nothing to write home about though. Adult Nijo did not love this game, but I can see why Kid Nijo did. If you want to ease your kids into this genre, then this game is for you. Sadly, the game is not available for digital purchase anywhere, and honestly, it's really not worth the hassle of finding a physical copy of it. Just let them play literally any other adventure game. My personal recommendation would be Nairi Tower of Shirin. Great story, fun gameplay, and adorable visuals. Perfect game to get kids into the genre. That's all for today. If you liked this video, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon. And if you're afraid of commitments, you can just buy me a coffee on coffee.com. If you want to see more videos like this, please consider subscribing. I want to say that my next video will be about Broken Sword, the Sleeping Dragon. However, honestly, these two games just made me tired of Revolution games. They burnt me out. Even though Golden Glory wasn't that bad, it wasn't good enough to get me over how much I hated in Cold Blood. So I've decided to take a small break from the Revolution Software Retrospective. I'll definitely get back to it at some point, but not anytime soon. My next video will be about a forgotten little horror game made by a highly acclaimed team. Thank you for watching.